please welcome Corporate Vice President Azure OSS Cloud Native, Brendan Burns. Hey there. How's it going, everybody? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here. I don't have, I don't know if you're here for Mark's session right before this. I don't have any cool robots, unfortunately. Um, but we are going to talk about security, which I hope everybody thinks is a really important topic. Uh, certainly, I, it's something when I think about the services that I'm delivering for our Azure customers, it's something that I'm thinking about a whole lot. And I've got a few statistics, statistics here just to kind of help emphasize the importance of security in the developer landscape. So recently, I think in the news, there's been a lot about supply chain attacks. That's been a very big focus, and it's a good focus to be thinking about. As you can see, we've seen a 650% increase in supply chain attacks. And I think in particular, when we think about dependency updates and management of open source libraries and things like that, it's really, really important to be realizing that updates and upgrades bring in bug fixes and oftentimes security fixes. They can also bring in security problems. And so having that notion of what is your supply chain, where does the software come from, and even are your build environments protected. And that leads to you know, the second statistic here, which is a 67% increase in hard-coded secrets. That's secrets that are in code, in repositories, sometimes even in public repositories that are available on the internet for people to build databases of cloud credentials, database passwords, and any number of other things that enable you to uh, attack your infrastructure. And then finally, as we look into containers and people running container-oriented infrastructure, we've seen a real increase in the number of containers that run with critical or high vulnerabilities. So hopefully, all of these numbers really serve to emphasize how important it is for us to be thinking about security, even as we build cloud-native applications. And I think what's really critical is that we think about how we integrate security into the software development lifecycle. You can see up here, if you're familiar with DevOps or you've done that sort of thing before, you can see sort of the standard circle of DevOps. And what I want us to be thinking about as we look at this circle is that in between each stage, whether it's code to CI, CD, to deployment, and into operations, there's a security step and frankly, a security product that Microsoft that can integrate into your DevSecOps workflow to ensure that your developers can easily stay secure. And that's an incredibly important point because traditionally, I think security or the CISO or the people who are responsible for this sort of thing haven't always had the best reputation with developers. And I can say that personally, you know, I've had my fair share of discussions with people who, frankly, were, were trying to institute things that slowed my, down my ability to release software. So what we really believe is that security that comes at the expense of developer productivity is really just a false sense of security. When you're delivering security out there into the world, it has to be something that is almost transparent to your developers, that they don't notice, uh, but that they gain the benefits of. And so integrating security throughout the code development workflow is the most critical piece of, of how you actually deliver secure software. Because oftentimes, if you don't do that, you know, your developers are just going to ignore or find workarounds around the various security things that you've had. And that leaves you believing that you've produced security, but not actually having delivered on security. Um, now, one of the critical parts of how we think about uh, Microsoft's secure so software development portfolio is that we have pieces in every single part of the software development lifecycle from things like GitHub Advanced Security that I'm going to talk about in just a second to the Azure Container Registry where we can scan images and look for vulnerabilities, even block your ability to pull down images from the Azure Container Registry. And then finally into Microsoft Defender for Cloud, which allows you to actually scan running images to look for misconfigurations that may have insecurities or images that have known vulnerabilities that you need to go in and remediate. And throughout this talk, we're going to step through through each of these different stages, and we're going to also uh, talk about um, ways in which uh, all of these things come together. But I think first we want to take a look at how important this kind of software is to people. And to illustrate that, we've got a customer, Yinsinju. They're a Norwegian insurance company, and they're going to show us how they use all of these products to secure their mission-critical applications. So we can roll the video. We are the largest insurance provider in Norway. Security is our brand. That's what we do as a company. We take data security very seriously. There are new threats, so you need to be sharp to innovate. We as a developers, we also need to be as clever as the hackers out there. We had IT security in one silo and application developers in their other silo. We wanted to build a platform which is secured by design. 
Now we have the new Azure application platform and we are calling it GAP, instead the application platform. We have collaborated with Microsoft from the start because they have a security first mindset in their own products. We really believe in the philosophy of you build it and you own it. We don't want to do the nitty gritty infrastructural thing. We want to build on top of Kubernetes and create a really nice application platform. And by containerizing the application, that has less impact on a bigger infrastructure getting compromised. We are using a managed identity, so each pod has their own identity. With the capabilities of GitHub Secrets and Azure Key Vaults, we are moving all our secrets out of the code. GitHub is a great tool. It has a lot of capabilities. I really like the advanced security. It gives the teams an easy way to scan your application for vulnerabilities. We have created a model where code is sort of open to everyone by default. We are getting the security issues and the bugs up in the light, and we have built-in security with automation every step of the way. When they first start with the pushing code, we are seeing tracking their dependencies with the Pandabot. We are tracking all lines of their code with uh, GitHub Advanced Security. This gives us power to our developers to contribute, to suggest, to comment, and to leverage the best practices from other teams. It gives us developer the velocity. That Microsoft is now uh, contributing a lot to open source, it's a sign of quality. The best thing about Azure platform is that it's integrated with best of the partner solutions available for you. It's a huge change in joy of working. We're much more predictable uh, in our deliveries to the business. The Yensida is a digital native company. Everything we do new, we do it in the cloud. We have the world record or the fastest payout, five seconds. We are not just building it for today's world threat. We wanted to make sure that we are secure for future challenges as well. We have a bright future in Yensida. All right, great. And so I think that hopefully really highlights for you the value uh, that GitHub Advanced Security can deliver for you, whether it's from code signing, um, which allows, or excuse me, code scanning, which allows you to look for vulnerabilities in your code, uh, to secret scanning that allows you to find passwords or credential keys or other sorts of personal uh, security information that developers may have accidentally checked into their code or their repositories, all the way through to dependency scanning, which can ensure that you've updated your dependencies at the right time to deliver um, the latest updates and the latest patches to all of your different libraries. And I can really say personally that this value, I've seen it on my own code and my own applications where I use tools like Dependabot to ensure that all of my container images stay up to date, that all of the dependencies inside of those container images stay up to date. I've also used CodeQL, and CodeQL has actually found honest to goodness security bugs in my code before I merged them as PRs. It identified a path traversal bug, a very common kind of attack, in a code that I'd sent as a pull request to one of my projects. And that code never actually managed to make it into the product um, because CodeQL found it. So it's a great way to do shift left into the developer. But I know that many people here at Build really value the, the pipelines and other kinds of tools that are available in Azure DevOps. And previously, a lot of these great tools have only been available to people within GitHub repositories. So that's why we're excited today to, get, to announce that we're bringing in GitHub Advanced Security for Azure DevOps. So all of those tools that people love in the open source and in GitHub Enterprise are now available on Azure DevOps as well. You can do the same code scanning, you can do the same dependency analysis with Dependabot, um, and you can do the same secret scanning that you could with GitHub. So it's a really bringing together of these two products. And to show you a little bit more of that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Brian Sullivan is the principal program manager who's going to show us a few more details about how that works. Here you go, Brian. All right, thank you, Brendan. Thanks, everybody. Um, so it's really, as Brendan was saying, there's really three key areas of developer security that GitHub Advanced Security for Azure DevOps brings. The first is dependency scanning. So that's going to help you find any vulnerable open source you may be using. Uh, second is a really powerful static analysis tool that's going to help you find any application security vulnerabilities in your own code. And then finally, we have secret scanning that is going to not only help you find any secrets that you may have already inadvertently exposed, but also, and this is even more important, it's going to help you keep them out and make sure they never get into your code in the first place. 
And I especially want to highlight that all of this is natively built in to Azure DevOps. It's as much a part of Azure DevOps as Azure repos and pipelines. So there's nothing for you to install, nothing for you to maintain. All right, so let's get on with the demo. And I'm going to start here uh, by showing dependency scanning. Now, um, <laughs> maybe at the risk of opening some old wounds, who in the room, who online spent December of 2021 dealing with log for j log for shell and I, I see a few hands, maybe, maybe even a few groans. I, I, I get it. I was there. I was, I, I was dealing with this for Microsoft too. But um, in truth, I think I may have had it a little bit easier than most. Because inside Microsoft, we use advanced security dependency scanning. So like, finding my vulnerable log4j was, was not really part of the problem for me. I could just come right here into my repo and see, like, in this list right here, all the vulnerable log4j that I have, just so I can see all the other vulnerable open source dependencies that, that I currently have. It, it's showing a bunch of NuGets, but it'll also detect NPM, Maven, Pipe, like a ton of these. So I can, I can take these and drill down and find out a little bit more. So here, I've got uh, a critical input validation problem in IP matcher, and you can see I've got really, really crisp, succinct guidance on how to fix this. Hey, like you're using version 1041, and that's got a critical vulnerability. Get yourself to 1042, and that's going to go away. And if I had enough time to do it, I would actually go make that change, and you would see that vulnerability just automatically disappear from this list. You don't have to maintain it manually. Uh, similarly, over here in code scanning, this is going to this is that code QL, that really powerful static analysis that Brendan was talking about, and this is going to look for your OWASP top 10 kind of issues, your CWE SANS top 25s, your 24 deadly sins of application security. So all of those kind of things in your own code, it's going to analyze those. And, and you see here, it's found it's found a few. It found a SQL injection in my code. Let me go dig in and find out a little bit more. So here's the exact line of code, the exact commit it came in on, and I've got really, really great guidance and even snippets of how to address this issue. So that's fantastic. Now, the final one is secret scanning, and this is a special case. So the first thing that advanced security is going to do when you turn this on, again, a single button click turns this on, it's going to start a background scan of all the commits across all the branches in this repos, not just tip of main. Like if an attacker somehow gets access to this repo, they're not just going to look at tip of main. They're going to look through your entire history. And, and that's why advanced security is going to do the same thing. So again, single button click gets you, gets you scan of all your commits, all your branches, and anything it finds shows up here. And again, I can, I can dig in to find out more about why and where. But the truth is, at this point, you're already in cleanup mode. And that's what makes secrets a really, really special case. Every other kind of AppSec vulnerability in the world, all your SQL injections, your cross-site scriptings, your deserializations, your overflows, all of these vulns can be fixed by you writing some new code and then building that code and deploying it everywhere the old vulnerable code was. But secrets don't work this way. Secrets, you're, you're done, you're exploitable the moment that secret touches source control, and just pushing a new commit over top is not going to help you. And you know you've got to go clean these up, right? Like you heard Brendan talk about how prevalent these are and how dangerous these are. So you've got to go do some work, but what's, what's the work to do? You've got to go kill these things permanently. You've got to revoke that cred. And before you revoke it, you've got to find everywhere that it's used and go rotate that first. And if you miss just one of those, you will probably cause a life site outage. So what you have here, like the moment you expose a cred in source control, you've got a lot of toil in front of you, which is bad, and you've got a lot of stress and fragility because there's a good chance you're going to end up causing like a, a runtime failure be that, because if you miss something. So for advanced security, we do our best to give you a better way, to make sure this never happens to you in the first place. So now I'm going to pop out to Visual Studio. I'm going to put my developer hat on. And I'm, I'm going to be writing some code. So let me, let me add a new function here. You see, I'm a super, super fast typist. Um, and this, this code, oops, accidentally, I'm not going to show the whole thing. This code accidentally exposes a credential. Now I'm going to save that. I'm going to give it a message, added new storage. And I'm typing badly, but you get it, function. 
I'm going to push that up to Azure DevOps. And what happened was Azure DevOps analyzed that and rejected the push because it contains secrets. You will never be happier in your life to have a push fail. You, like, this, saved, this saved me right now a ton of work. The cr thank you, thank you. Like the cred has not been exposed. Like it, it went up to the server for analysis, the push was rejected. At this point, all I have to do to fix it is like, oh, I will move this credential out to Key Vault, I'll squash merge it back in. The squash merge is important because otherwise it would still be in your outgoing commit history. I'll squash merge it and push and I'm done. Five minutes worth of work versus days of stressful toil. So we, we love the solution from that, like a, a really good time-saving shift left defense. And I want to clarify, there's nothing happening client-side here. All that analysis is taking place in advanced security on Azure DevOps. So I, no matter what IDE I'm using, like it, CLI, it doesn't matter. It's going to protect all incoming pushes. And the best part is, all of this is available for you right now. Uh, you can go sign up for the public preview that we just launched yesterday. And the sign-up URL is akams slash advanced security signup. All right, back to you, Brendan. Cool, thanks so much, Brian. And I think it's a really great illustration of how important it is to have automatic security that effectively a developer doesn't have to do anything. They can do whatever kind of checking in of code that they want to, or excuse me, of writing of, of code that they want to, put a secret in there, um, and it won't even make it into your branch. It won't even make it into your repo. I want to move on from the code that, are, that we write to how we think about the deployment side of the house, right? Once you build an image, once you have that code checked in properly, you've tested it, you've vetted it, um, how do you know that that code that has been built in your build pipelines actually makes it out? Sorry, I should advance the slides. Um, how do you know that that code has made it actually out to uh, the place where you're running and that the thing that is running in an environment like the Azure Kubernetes service or Azure Container Apps is actually the code that was built? Well, code, scan, or code, code signing is the way that that's done. And we have a bunch of tools within the supply chain uh, of what we have in Microsoft to ensure that the code that you deploy is secure and is, in fact, the code that you built. So we start with a tool called Trivi. It's an open source project. What you'll see is that most of what we do here is actually open source uh, and in the nature of the cloud native world that is largely happening within the confines of vendor neutral open source. So we start with a project called Trivi that can do code scanning for you. We move on to a project called Copacetic, which I, uh, allows you to patch images without having to involve developers. So the ability to, to you know, do a patch like a log4j fix across your entire organization without going through each developer team one by one by one. It's an amazing way to speed up remediation. And then finally, on to Notary for code signing and integration with the Azure Kubernetes service to ensure that the only containers that you can push out into the Azure Kubernetes service are containers that are signed and that contain no vulnerabilities. And so to give us a better and more detailed understanding of how this all works together, I want to invite up onto the stage Rita Zhang, who's a principal software engineer in the Azure Containers upstream open source team who's going to illustrate how a lot of these open source projects come together. Rita? Thanks, Brendan. My team at Microsoft is responsible for building CNCF Kubernetes container images and artifacts for the whole company. And we do this with a bunch of the open source tools that Brendan just showed. And we also came up with a pattern to ensure the whole company is following the same uh, process for, to ensure and enhance security posture of the images we ship to our customers. Uh, now, next, I'm going to demo real quick uh, how you can use the same open source tools uh, and leverage them for your own images. Here, uh, I basically just made some changes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, push the code in. And what this does is it's going to uh, kick off my build pipeline. Um, and this build pipeline does a couple of things, right? It builds the container image. Uh, and it, it will basically scan the image for vulnerabilities, and it's going to uh, patch the image to make sure from day one, when the image lands in my container registry, it has less vulnerabilities. Now, I'm going to run all this uh, locally so you can see what the build pipeline is actually doing. First, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull an image locally to make sure I can scan and patch. Uh, next, I'm going to use Trivi to basically scan the image 
uh, and be able to uh, take the output from the scan uh, and let's take a look at the scan result. So here, as you can see, uh, these are a bunch of packages that have vulnerabilities, right? Um, so next, I'm going to take that scan result and uh, pass it to Copa. Uh, again, Copathetic is a, a open source solution that we use to patch uh, the container image. Uh, and it, as you can see here, um, this is uh, an open source project that anyone can use. Uh, and it is built on top of BuildKit. Uh, it basically updates the vulnerable packages, creates a patch layer on top of your image, and creates a new image tag. All right, so now I have this locally. You see that it works locally. Let's uh, go to our uh, build pipeline. Here in this build pipeline, as you can see, it completes. Uh, it, it basically created the container image. It did the scan and patch. Uh, and it also updated my uh, deployment YAML on, uh, to, to use the latest and patched image that is going to be pushed to my Kubernetes cluster. Now, this is great. Now, um, as Brian showed earlier, we made sure that the code doesn't have the, uh, any secrets. And now with both scan and patch, I made sure that the image that I'm pushing to my production container registry is actually vulnerability free. Um, now, on top of that, just like any other binaries that I'm going to push to my production cluster, I also need to make sure it's trusted, right? It's coming from a trusted source. And to do that, we need something like notation. A notation is an open source software that helps me uh, be able to assign my image. Now, coming back to uh, my build pipeline, uh, here, let me just uh, pop this up. Uh, here is my build pipeline. Uh, first, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add a couple of tasks just to uh, make sure I can um, uh, add a, a configured notation to let notation know, hey, uh, go ahead and use the certificate stored in my uh, Azure Key Vault and go ahead and use that uh, to uh, sign the image. Uh, next, I am going to configure notation to push the, uh, the, the signed uh, signature artifact to my container registry. Right? I want to make sure that the signed signature is sitting next to my image so that I can, oops, sorry. <laughs> so then I can, um, so then I can uh, uh, verify it later. All right, I've made the update. Now let's go ahead and save this, uh, and then push the update to the pipeline. And then while, uh, and sorry, let me just quickly push this in to my Git repository. And this basically kicks off the, the build pipeline again. Now, while this is getting, uh, while the image is getting signed, uh, let me also update my Kubernetes cluster, right? So in my Kubernetes cluster, I already have open policy agent uh, Gatekeeper running. And Gatekeeper is an emission webhook that basically allows me to manage a lot of the Kubernetes policies that I want to enforce across my Kubernetes clusters. Things like, you know, is it coming from a trusted registry? Uh, is it, does my pod have um, uh, resource limits? Things of that nature. So now, next, obviously, we want to uh, roll out a policy that ensures that we are actually uh, deploying uh, pods that are using signed images, right? So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and install Ratify. Uh, Ratify is another open source solution that you can use uh, to uh, verify things like image or maybe license for your container image. And here I'm basically configuring uh, Ratify to be able to communicate to Gatekeeper. Uh, and on top of that, I'm also telling Ratify where to pull the certificate uh, from uh, the Azure Key Vault in order to do uh, image verification. All right, uh, Ratify is installed in the cluster. Uh, that's great. Next, let's roll out some policies. Um, so here, as you can see, is a, a Gatekeeper constraint YAML, which is how we're uh, uh, deploying our policies. And here, what this policy is saying is, hey, for any deployment, any pod that is de deployed to the default namespace, uh, make sure we call Ratify to do Im uh, image signature verification. And if the signature is not valid, it's, it's not verified, then go ahead and de uh, deny that uh, emission request. 
All right, so coming back to my cluster, let's actually test this. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just run Nginx from Docker Hub. Um, please don't do this in production. Uh, so as you can see, uh, Gatekeeper Webhook basically rejected the, the deployment uh, because as we all know, the Nginx from Docker Hub, it was not signed with my uh, image signing process, right? Um, so, so now that we verified all this is working, uh, so let's go back to, oops, sorry. Now let's go back to the pipeline. Uh, th as, you, as you remember, uh, this is the pipeline that I just updated. Um, it, it has the scan and patch that we did earlier, uh, and we added signing. And so now we know the image that is stored in my container registry uh, is signed with our certificate. Um, and, and obviously, uh, we also updated the Kubernetes deployment to make sure the application that is deployed is running with a new patched and signed image. Um, now, coming back to Coming back to the Kubernetes cluster, let's actually take a look at the application, um, make sure it is running properly. Uh, yep, and now as you can see, it's using uh, the latest image and the, the, the replicas are running as well. Now finally, um, let's take a look at the uh, ratify logs, right? Um, and, and just to see with the request that's coming through from the API server, uh, the uh, Ratify takes the request and actually talks to uh, the container registry, and here it, it says, hey, looks like the, the signatures that you have is verified and, 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 and it's a success, successful request, and that decision is, gets propagated all the way back to the Kubernetes API server, and that is why the deployment was successful. All right, well, with that, back to you, Brandon. Um, that's a really great example, I think, of how you can ensure that the code that you've written um, has, the, has no vulnerabilities in it at the time when you push that image and has no vulnerabilities in it when you deploy it out to your cluster, as well as the fact that it is exactly the same code that you've built in your build environment that is running in the production environment and you don't have random images running uh, from the internet running everywhere. Um, but of course, the last piece of securing your code is actually what happens when that code is out there running in production. I think we all know that many of the most serious vulnerabilities that have happened are vulnerabilities that actually are, have been present in a library for a really long time and just not fixed in time. Uh, and so the only way to find that is runtime scanning. And to tell us more about how Microsoft Defender for Cloud can help with runtime scanning for containers, I want to welcome to the stage David Trigano, a security program manager who's going to show you more. Thank you, Brendan. Hi, everyone. Now that my container images are securely built and push, security continues. To protect cloud native application, Microsoft provides a comprehensive platform called Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Microsoft Defender for Cloud allows security teams and developers to collaborate across their software development lifecycle using contextualized security capabilities from code to cloud. Microsoft Defender for Cloud allows security teams to have unified DevSecOps visibility across their GitHub and Azure DevOps environments and provide native integrations with GitHub Advanced Security and GitHub Advanced Security for Azure DevOps. Let me show you how it works. So here I am in my Microsoft Defender for Cloud platform where my security teams can have an overview of their security posture across their cloud environments. They can also see potential threats and malicious activities that were found by Microsoft Defender for Cloud across their resources. By clicking on DevOps security, security teams can have an aggregated view of all their GitHub and Azure DevOps environments alongside findings that are coming from GitHub Advanced Security and GitHub Advanced Security for Azure DevOps. They have an inventory of all the GitHub and all the Azure DevOps and repositories that were onboarded into Microsoft Defender for Cloud. They can see all the secrets, all the vulnerabilities, all the misconfigurations on their infrastructure as code, and all the potential code vulnerabilities that were found by these products. By clicking on, an, for example, an Azure DevOps repository, security teams can also configure a feature called pull request annotations. Pull request annotations allow security teams to inform developers when a misconfiguration is found during build time within their pull request. 
Let me show you how it works in Azure DevOps. So here in Azure DevOps, I see that I have some pull requests that are currently active. Let's take this one, which is a pull request that was done by Lara, one of our developers who tries to provision an AKS cluster. Let's see what Lara is actually doing. So here, I see that Lara is actually deploying an IC template, and it seems like Microsoft Defender for Cloud informs Lara that there are some misconfigurations on this infrastructure as code templates, such as the fact that RBAC should be used on Kubernetes services. Lara gets all the remediation information, allowing her to fix these misconfigurations before deploying the resource, alongside a link that gives to Lara more information on how to fix this misconfiguration. Another misconfiguration that we found is, for example, the fact that AK cluster should use Key Vault to store secrets. In the same way that we provided to Lara another, more information, Lara can also know what are the remediation and, the, and, and how to fix that misconfiguration with a link that gives to Lara more information about that misconfiguration and some examples that allows developers to fix those misconfigurations before hitting production environments. Let's go back to Microsoft Defender for Cloud. As we said, security teams can have an aggregated view of all their DevOps security findings in the DevOps security blade. By going to recommendations, security teams can also have a comprehensive view of all the vulnerabilities that were found by Microsoft Defender for Cloud across their software development lifecycle. If you open remediate vulnerabilities, we can see that here, Microsoft Defender for Cloud informs the security teams of potential infrastructure as code findings that were found by GitHub Advanced Security and GitHub Advanced Security for Azure DevOps. They can also see all the affected resources and assign a specific owner to a repository, allowing developers to be notified where misconfigurations are found in their repositories. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this demo, security continues across the board. When it comes to protect container images that are running in container registries and containers that are running in Azure Kubernetes services, Microsoft provides a solution that is built on Microsoft Defender Vulnerability Management, which is an in-house agent that is being used by Microsoft to scan container images that are being pushed in Azure container registries. As you can see here, Microsoft Defender for Cloud gives to the security admins all the, all the important information allowing the security teams to take actions. You see here that Microsoft Defender for Cloud found more than 800 vulnerabilities across nine invulnerable images. As please note, this is a demo environment. When we deal with real customers and real environments, we, hit, we see customers that have hundreds and thousands of misconfiguration. Now the question is how security admins can prioritize their most critical vulnerabilities on their most critical cloud native applications. For that, Microsoft Defender for Cloud provides a solution called attack path analysis. Attack pass analysis allows security teams to focus on resources that matter the most for their organization, allowing them to remediate the most critical and exposed resources they have within their environment. For example, here, Microsoft Defender for Cloud informs me that there is a publicly accessible Kubernetes that runs on my environment with high severity vulnerabilities. It shows to the security teams what are the paths that a potential hacker or malicious user will follow to gain access to that resource and then perform malicious activities, such as running malicious code, perform crypto mining activity, or potentially extract sensitive data. With these capabilities, what will take you hours or days to fix can be now fixed very quickly. Back to you, Brendan. Well, thank you so much, David. I hope that gives you a really great uh, example of how we have end-to-end -end solutions that are developer-focused and developer-friendly, but still ensure the core security of your applications. Now, an important part, actually, of security is the code itself, as well as all of the automation that you use and the identity of that code. How do you log into databases? How do you log in users? And to talk to us more about how identity fits into the security story, I want to invite Levant and Colin up onto the stage, and they're going to talk to you about the Entra developer platform. Thanks, guys. Thank you, buddy. Boom. All right. Good afternoon, Build. I'm Levant Besek, VP of Product for Microsoft Entra Developer Platform. And I'm Colin Davis, VP of Engineering for that platform. Today, we're going to talk about how you can easily add an identity layer to your applications or services with modern end user experiences and enterprise grade security. Let's start with what developers love to do, creating great experiences for their users 
that solve problems, drive engagement, and grow their businesses. Here's what developers don't love to do. Writing code to protect their apps and users from ever-changing security and compliance requirements. Let's be honest. No one wakes up in the morning excited to add identity management into their applications. And frankly, unless you are an identity expert, you should not be in the business of building identity or security systems either. That's where Microsoft Antra can help. Today, we offer a suite of products under Microsoft Antra umbrella to protect identities of all kinds. Microsoft Antra helps you create a strong AI-driven security posture, enable governance, and reduce fraud in your applications. Millions of customers have adopted them, and we have a huge ecosystem of partners who have integrated with our solutions. Currently, we have two great solutions for building identity workflows into applications. We have Azure AD Workforce for Enterprise, which powers employee and partner or business-to-business -business collaboration use cases. We also have Azure AD B2C, which is for enabling consumers to log into an app or service. Azure AD B2C is a very powerful platform that already powers many of the top apps that you love and use today, such as Subway, iHeartMedia, and more, and it has hundreds of millions of active users. While it's super powerful, we also heard strong feedback from developers, though, that it can be challenging for, for them to get it up and running due to its complicated developer experience. Moreover, it's missing some of the latest innovations that are already in our Azure AD Workforce platform. We know developers and admins needed a simpler path. That's why we've been working very hard to bring these two platforms together and build a next-generation developer-first identity solution to serve all external user types. It's called Microsoft Antra External ID. And today, we're excited to announce the public preview of this new platform. Microsoft Antra External ID is a modern developer-first platform designed to help you create custom, frictionless sign-up and sign experiences that will delight your end users. It inherits all the latest innovations from Azure AD core platforms, such as identity governance and ID protection. Plus, it meets the high security standards and offers the effortless compliance and scale that CISOs have come to expect from Azure. So let's dig in more. Let's start with customization. Look, we know how important it is for you to have a native, natural-looking sign-in experience that blends in with the rest of your apps. If it doesn't, you have a jarring experience, it confuses users, you end up losing them. So external ID comes out of the box with a web-hosted sign-in authentication experience that allows you to easily change the branding, change the color, and make sure your users feel right at home when they get there and they're logging in. But we're going even further. Coming soon, we're going to have a native SDK. That native SDK is going to allow for you to be able to build pixel-perfect embedded sign-in and sign-up experiences directly within your mobile and web applications, all while still maintaining assurance that you're doing it right, it's secure, and you don't have to worry about it. We're also going to have flexible user journey orchestration. You'll be able to hook up these sign-in or sign-up events to other systems, such as your CRM, for example. You know, when we set out on this product initiative, we wanted to make very sure that the developer experience was easy. And so that's why we actually built a getting started wizard that with just a few clicks, you can automatically create your brand new tenant, configure it with the branding and the coloring and, and, and the look and feel that you want, and it generates the code for you. You can see it's just a couple lines of code, but those, those lines of code are generated for you. They automatically populate the appropriate tenant information, and you're ready to go. We're not going to stop there. We also have uh, plans to add integrations within Visual Studio and VS Code to make this even easier, especially with those native SDKs when they become available. And last but not least, Microsoft external, Entra external identities is uh, built on top of Azure AD. If you remember, Levent talked about how before, developers had to choose. They had to choose from getting the richness, scale, security of Azure AD with the flexibility and customizability of B2C. That's no more. Now, developers can have all the security capabilities like AI-driven conditional access, role-based access controls, custom policies, and more. If you're one of the many customers who use Azure AD already, this will feel very familiar to you. You'll be able to set it up, and it will be a breeze. Of course, that also means that it's sitting on top of a 
globally available, massively scaled system that already supports millions and millions of users, and it's really easy to get started with. And now I'd like to bring up Ankur Patel to show off that getting started wizard and, and show you how you can get started with external ID. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Ankur. Hey, everyone. My name is Ankur Patel. I'm with the identity team. I'm thrilled to share with you the new developer platform. Uh, this is the landing page for the new Identity Developer Center. This is a one-stop shop for you to learn all about how to add authentication and authorization to any app. Uh, it provides an access to our latest set of APIs, software development, it's our SDKs, samples, blogs, and blueprints that cover how to secure your app and get the best performance out of it. We've also created a new easy-to-start trial, so you can try out these capabilities as you dive in. So let's do that now. We'll click on Let's Get Started. This is the new quick start experience you will see now. Uh, this hides away all the complexity of setting up a new tenant, creating a domain name, etc., including a region. We can choose to configure these to our needs. For our demo, this works. So let's click uh, Continue to go on with the quick start. While the tenant settings get applied, the next thing we'll see is the ability to choose our preferred sign-in or sign-up policy. Uh, it's just two clicks now. You can choose a password-driven policy or a password-less experience. Um, since passwords are evil, we're going to go with a password-less experience. Next, we can uh, choose our logo and branding. So let me click Browse, and we can pick our lo company logo. We can choose the branding color that we like. The teal color works. And then we can go with the rest of the branding look and feel, such as right aligned. This looks about right, so we can click Continue, and the Quick Stop Wizard will now set up the sign-up page uh, for us. As the page gets spun up for this specific tenant configuration, we can now uh, click Run It Now. So let me grab my mouse here, and we'll click on Run It Now as a check mark. Here we go. The branding gets applied, and we can see our logo is present, the colors are present, it's right aligned, the sign-up page looks good. Let's go back to our quick start and continue the quick start wizard. Next, we get to choose the type of application we want to connect the sign-up page to. In this case, we support templates for single page apps as well as web applications and soon mobile applications. For our demo, we'll choose single page application. Many languages supported, Angular, JavaScript, and React. We're going to go with JavaScript in this case. And we can download the sample. While the sample is downloading, you can notice it's just three quick steps now to run this app. Unzip, start your NPM server locally, and the app is up and running. Before we do that, let's switch over to VS Code and take a look at this sample. This is a normal Node.js app that will help a user sign up and sign in, and then show the issued user token. Let's take a look at the configuration value here. If I zoom in, you'll notice that the client ID and the authority or the tenant is already pre-configured. And this will be passed along to the Microsoft Authentication Library, or MCEL, no longer having to do all those things by hand. This SDK is used to authenticate users and access secure web APIs that will ensure security and deliver a great experience. Finally, let's see how easy it is to implement the sign-in experience itself using the library. So if we zoom in, we'll notice that MCEL does all the heavy lifting for signing and sign up. We create an MCEL public client application which, where we pass in the configuration value that we had looked at. Next, we wire up the sign-in button to be called to pass on our login request. And then finally, once the call is completed, the handle response method updates our page with the user details. This all looks about right. So let's test this out. We'll start the server locally with npm start. Let me type that up. And we get our server up and running. It's up and running. We can switch to the browser. And here's our sample app. There's a nice sign in button. We'll go click on it. It will call up the sign up page that we have configured. It has our branding and logo. Um, in this case, we are signing up a new user. So let me click on create one. In this case, we'll use my alternate uh, persona, jamescasey at gmail.com, to do the testing. I'll switch to my Gmail account. We'll go get the eight-digit one-time passcode that MCEL generated for us. We'll switch back to the browser, type this in, and we can click Next. 
MSAL goes and verifies that this is the correct credential. It even brings in all the identity token values after the user has signed up and signed in and easily show it to you. So what we just saw is Microsoft enter our external ID, create a new tenant, customize our branding, the user journey, sign up a user and sign in. All of this done in minutes, what used to take hours. I'll send it back to Levant for the rest of our conversation. All right. Thank you, Ankur. Thanks, Ankur. I mean, James. So first of all, I want to thank the team that's built this. They've spent a lot of time on making what you just saw to get it picture, like just super, super simple for engineers. Uh, I love code that writes itself. For those of you that are keenly observant, you will have noticed that the libraries that were in that code sample are exactly the same libraries that developers already use to interact with AAD. It's really simple. It just shows you how easy it is to get started using external ID. But what if your users never had to sign up at all? What if you never had to put forms in front of them and ask them to fill in information in order to create an account? And uh, to, to tell you a little bit more about that. All right. So I think we all know that the current identity constructs based on usernames and passwords are a little bit outdated, would you say, right? Um, adding MFA was a great step forward, but it feels like evolving the horse buggy than really inventing the automobile. The good news is that we think a new era of identity is here, and that's verifiable credentials with Microsoft Enter Verified ID. Verified ID automates verification of identity credentials based on open standards. It enables users to get verified once and use them ver those verified credentials everywhere, which eliminates the need to you know, prove yourself over and over again to different services and apps. And since users have strict control on how and whom they share their credentials with, it is much more trusted and privacy preserving. And the best news, we're natively integrating verified ID into external ID, and soon you'll be able to include it in your user journeys for ex external ID. So there are a ton of use cases where verified ID can reduce user friction in your app and increase trust. Using verified ID, you can now transform your app in just a few minutes and eliminate the need for separate identity proofing or progressive profiling. You get everything in that credential that you verify. You can also reduce fraud and costs associated with that uh, process. We envision customers issuing verified credentials for unlocking offers with partners, remote onboarding, cross-marketing, coupons, and even more use cases. Today, we're excited to announce that Wallet SDK for Verified ID is now generally available for you to use in production. And now, I'm going to invite Ankur back on stage, and he's going to show some of the cool things you can do with Verified ID. Thanks, Lavan. Hey, everyone. Um, can we go back to the slides, please, on the main display? Looks like it is for you, not for me. I'll use it this way. Um, so in this case, Northwind Airlines is an application, and this is their app journey today. We can sign in using our existing username and password, which you could have created using external ID, as we did using usernames and passwords, or MFA, or whatever the journey might be. So let's say the user types this in. Using the new uh, Antra Verified ID software development kit, you can use this wallet library to now transform your existing access token into a digital loyalty card, right? Let's take a look at how. It's four lines of code. We're passing in that identity token, which comes from your trusted identity system, which could be Azure Active Directory, or it could be a third-party OpenID Connect provider. And you're able to call this standards-based API to say, please create me a verified ID. And we need to make sure we take care of all the right protocols and standards that need to be applied. The user is then issued a digital loyalty card with the claim attributes that come from your trusted directory system, whatever that might be. The power of open standards now, though, is I can use this credential not only online, but also in person, such as at a lounge, or when I need to verify with a help desk. Often when we get a call on a help desk, like, please help me, how do we know who is calling? versus we can now present this credential, or use it with third-party partners, which is another form of federation, if you will, right? except based on open standards, so making it far more scalable. So let's take a look at one of these. Imagine we are accessing a lounge. We can scan a QR code when we arrive at the lounge, or tap and present it over NFC. The request here to take a look at the code 
is a verified presentation. So in this case, if you notice, you're asking for a verified presentation of a card of type loyalty card. But that card could be anything. It could be a loyalty card, it could be a coupon, it could be a driver's license, it could be an employee credential. In this case, we want a card from Northwind Airlines, and it's their loyalty card. The user sees a simple request that says, please present this card to that lounge for this access. So it's just like multi-factor authentication, except you're asking for a credential that is a digital loyalty card. The user can click Next. The application can use enter verified ID and that wallet SDK to ensure that, yep, this credential is the correct schema. It was actually issued by Northwind Airlines, and the user is the only one who presented it, making it far simpler than how it is today. Another key scenario where this shines is Help Desk. So if we call Help Desk today, you can ask for these types of credentials, but how do we know that the person who's calling is indeed the right person, or in this case, is changing an airline? So we probably want to make sure the person calling is indeed the right person and not just someone pretending to be the case. So in the case of Northwind Airlines, they have issued a biometric data along with it, like passport when you booked an airline ticket. So you can now use the same wallet SDK to verify the identity of this person. In this case, we are able to take a selfie, request a selfie of the user, and match it against that government-issued ID or a loyalty ID if you had one on file. If we look at the code on the, right, on the right side, notice the issuer here is Northwind Airlines. And on the bottom, we are asking for the credential type to be a face check. We're requesting a photo, and the confidence threshold is 70. So what's sent to the application then is whether or not the threshold was matched, not the actual photo. This service is now available as part of the wallet SDK as a preview feature. Finally, once we verify the true identity of a person, you can now issue a credential, such as a travel voucher, to say, yes, you're eligible for a travel voucher. This voucher is just another verified ID, which could work with a partner or your own service making it far more intuitive for the user to keep up with these workflows rather than doing different gestures every time, right? So you could have a whole wallet full of these things. So to recap the scenario that Levant was mentioning, these kinds of interactions can help with scenarios like know your customer, help reduce fraud or account takeover risks, because we can make sure the person presenting this credential is the same one to whom you issued it, rather than any random person who picks up a phone. We can make sure we can streamline the experience to not only present this credential to your own app or website, but also with partners, with that simple one-line request to say, I want to accept a digital loyalty card from these partners, versus how much work we have to put in today to do the same. And then finally, we believe it helps uh, reduce help desk costs where establishing that first identity based on knowledge-based questions or email round trip is just not proving effective. So yeah, just some examples of what you can unlock with Entra Verified ID and that wallet SDK that's generally available today. Lavant will share some more resources with you, so I'll call him back on. All right. That was awesome. Levant, can you imagine if at the next big conference we just use our verified ID instead of having to wait in line at registration? I can't wait. It would be incredible, man. It's going to be phenomenal. Uh, yeah, that's the future. And um, to, so to recap today, we announced the public preview of Microsoft Entra External ID our next generation modern developer first identity solution to serve all external user types. We also uh, showed you how Microsoft Enter Verified ID is a step function evolution of identity management. It lets you recognize customers at your front door without violating their privacy. Finally, we announced that the wallet SDK for verified ID is generally available. So, whether you're building new applications or updating existing ones, here's how we can get started uh, with what we showed you today. Once you've had a chance to test out our platform, please do send us feedback. Your feedback is extremely valuable to us as we continue to improve and iterate on these products. And you know, together, let's build what's next. And the best is yet to come. Thank you. Cool. All right, folks. Thank you so much for attending. I, uh, we've got a bunch of related sessions that you can see here, either uh, you know, on the live stream or, or later on. Um, and I hope you've seen how we can both secure the development of your applications, the deployment of your applications, the runtime of your applications, and the users of those applications with a bunch of great technology across the Microsoft Azure Cloud. Thank you so much. Hope you've enjoyed Build, and uh, we'll see you next time.